All right. Thank you so much, Cody. And uh, thank you to the Milo Baker chapter for having me and thank you all for attending. I'm really excited to share with you this presentation. I'm going to be profiling um, some of the uh, some of the plant communities and habitat types and their denizens in my home turf, which is Nevada and Placer counties. Uh, last year was a very interesting year to say the least. And uh, I spent it pretty much getting out into the woods and visiting all my plant friends and photographing them. And so I'm gonna share some of those photographs with you. And uh, we do have quite a bit to get through here. So I'm going to move fast. And uh, go ahead, if you have any questions, just leave them in the chat and um, I'll get asked those at the end. Um, I'll stick around as long as it takes to answer all your questions. So, all right, so these are the habitats we're gonna go through today. Um, these are the overarching habitats that you'll find in Nevada and Placer counties. Uh, there's quite a, quite a lot of them and there's a lot of overlap. Um, for instance, you know, we have riparian and aquatic habitats. You're gonna find riparian and aquatic habitats running through each of these. And the lines are kind of blurred. Um, so uh, I just went with a, a general idea for each of these. Okay, in uh, Nevada and Placer counties together, we have an astonishing 3,000 taxa of plants, of which about 2,400 are native and about 150 are rare. And so we have a high level of diversity. And one of the, well, some of the reasons uh, owing to that are the fact that we are the southernmost extent for plants which uh, are known from like the Pacific Northwest and uh, areas to the north. We're the northernmost extent for some taxa that come up from Southern California. Um, we get plants that are coastal plants uh, and ending up disjunct out in our region. And we even have a little bit of desert habitat as well. So owing to the gradients in moisture in elevation and the uh, elevation, then um, you, know, you get a lot of diversity in our area. So it's a very special, special place to get to explore. Um, before we get going, I wanna talk about some of the things that I bring with me uh, always on hand when I'm in the field, when I'm looking at plants. Uh, number one is my cell phone. Uh, we live in an era where I can carry a little computer with me. And whereas botanists of the past had to lug dozens of pounds of camera equipment or they had to sit in field and draw out meticulously the characters of a plant or describe them using this really intense vernacular i can merely snap a picture with my cell phone and i do keep a copy of the jepson manual on my phone as well so i can look up information in the field um, i have my clip-on lenses you're going to see some photographs which utilize that uh, they allow me to get really close detailed photos of some really important plant parts like the characters of these very tiny hairs that might be 0.1 millimeters long. Um, I also carry a hand lens because sometimes uh, I just want to look real quick. Uh, a notebook for taking notes. It's especially important if I'm going to be making collections for deposit in an herbarium that I write down notes about the, um, the location, the associated plants, what the habitat is like, uh, and any other characters that, that might be worth noting. I always have a ruler with me. That's super important too because you want to be able to take pictures of plants uh, that have some sort of reference for the size. Uh, a lot of keying of plants comes down to differences in the size of say the corolla lobes or the size of the anthers. And so having a, a ruler really makes that handy. Um, I bring collection bags, which are just plain old Ziploc bags. And you can um, you know, take plants and put them in the Ziploc bags, bring them home, keep them in the refrigerator, just like a, a vegetables you get at the grocery store or something and they'll keep for, um, for, for some time and gives you a chance to key them out or then you can take them home and put them in my plant press. Uh, and then I use iNaturalist pretty extensively. You can follow me on iNaturalist if you want. I go by Sapien Shane on there and you can see every single plant that I see. Um, I upload probably close to 50 a day, <laughs> average, something around there. Um, and I also use Calflora a lot because uh, it's always nice to take a little bit of shortcut uh, when you don't feel like uh, keying something out. That's really difficult. It's really nice to have resources like that where you can compare to pictures and you can get an idea for the diversity of the plants in any given area that you're exploring. And uh, field guides, which uh, I'm carrying less and less now that I have my, um, my, my phone and all the resources, the digital resources on there. But field guides can be really handy, although of course they are somewhat limited because you can't possibly fit every single plant in there and who wants to carry around 
30 pounds of a Jepson manual. I know that's an over-exaggeration, but that's what it feels like, about 30 pounds. Okay, so let's get into it. We're going to talk about, we're going to go basically from the valley floor, and we're going to go over this year in Crest, and we're going to end at the Nevada border. Nevada and Placer counties are northwest of Sacramento in the Sierras, and they're uh, what some of the few counties that actually cover a full transect of the Sierras from the grasslands, which we're going to talk about now, and again, heading over to the Nevada border. So the grasslands, uh, as the name implies, there's a lack of trees. You know, you might have some riparian corridors where you have things like cottonwoods. Uh, um, you might have a valley oak every once in a while out there, but it's pretty much filled with uh, native and ever more increasingly uh, non-native grasses. Uh, and a really intense herbaceous layer. So you get really nice wildflower blooms in areas where the habitat is still intact. And some of the plants you'll see out there are like lupins and poppies, uh, paintbrushes, and of course our various bulbs and our geophytes. All right, so the first thing we're gonna talk about is the Mediae. These, the Mediae are the tarweeds and their allies. Um, I think at one point in the past, these were all called Media, but they have been split up into various genera uh, which differ on things like the shape of the seeds or whether they have a pappus or not. Uh, the pappus is like the little, think of like a dandelion seed. It's the little feathery bit that attaches to the seed and aids with dispersal. Um, and then other features like anther color, or how showy the flowers are. Uh, so in this picture here, we have a couple of genera represented. We have media, of course. Uh, we have centromedia, uh, gentsia, lagophylla, um, calicodemia, and then there's a, a bunch of other uh, genera too that fall into the tarweeds. They smell amazing. They're covered in these resinous hairs. Uh, one of my favorite summertime smells, and you can probably go out right now and find a decent amount of tarweeds in, in anywhere in California. All right, here's a, a couple from the Orobankiaceae. Uh, these are the paintbrushes and um, the, and we, we have two Trifocerea species which occur in our area. I'm going to start on the right side with the uh, Johnny Tuck, or some people call it butter and eggs, this Trifocerea Ariantha, uh, really common uh, early spring wildflower, uh, really, really gorgeous plant with the purple coloration mixed with the yellow and white of the flowers there. Uh, and then in the center, we have Trifocerea versicolor. These two Trifocerea are pretty much the only two that we have in our, uh, in, in Nevada and Placer counties. Um, the yellow owl's clover, um, one of those plants which is called the clover, but it's not related to a clover at all. Uh, and then on the left side, we have Castilea tenuata, which is the valley tassel. Um, Castilea and Trifocerea, again, both in Orobankiaceae. Uh, the difference between them is going to be that Castilea on their anthers are going to have two anther sacs. So you really do need your hand lens or your macro lens to, um, to discern this. And the Trifocerea have one anther sac per stamen. Um, and so that's an easy way, well, sort of easy way to tell them apart, just so long as you have a hand lens. And the Castileo over here, in our area at least, is a really common um, early spring one. And it's one of the two groups of Castileo that we have in California. Uh, this one being the flowers that have um, three pouches on the bottom lip. So if you look at this, this is the flower over here. And these white tipped um, parts are the bracts. These are the three pouches at the bottom. And so these ones, the three pouched ones are typically pollinated by bees. And then the other group, the, um, the paint brushes, which are usually red in coloration, have tubular flowers. They don't have the pouches at the bottom and they're usually pollinated by hummingbirds. So uh, the two different groups have different pollinators, which I think is really interesting. Uh, here's two flowers that you're likely to find in the grasslands. We have Blenosperma and Manum. Uh, which is called glue seed because the seeds have this like viscous milky latex and uh, I believe it helps them like stick to animals and birds and helps them disperse the, the seed. They're um, in the aster family really uh, sort of relatively uncommon in our area and so it's always a, a delight. You could easily mistake it for something like gold fields uh, which don't have those sticky seeds and gold fields are probably the most one of the most common herbaceous uh, annual plants in all of California. You'll see them everywhere. Uh, and then on the right, we have Plantago erecta, um, which is so nice to have a native Plantago because you will see the two common non-native ones and, and several other species, but the two Lanceolata and I think it's major, Plantago major, uh, the common plantain. Those two are everywhere, but they're European plants um, were brought over here. This one, however, is a native, the Plantago erecta, 
And uh, though it's very small, you know, the maximum size, maybe two or three inches tall, uh, there's actually uh, pollinators and, that rely on this plant. There's caterpillars that, uh, where the butterfly lays its egg strictly on this plant. Uh, so it's very important for the wildlife and the ecosystem at large. Okay, moving on to the geophytes. And geophytes are basically plants that arise from an underground corm or bulb. Um, and so these ones I'm sure you'll recognize. We have uh, four different, I almost said three different genera, but recently one of the uh, genuses was changed. So starting in the upper left corner, uh, we have a Brodia. Uh, this is in the family Themidaceae. And we actually have three Brodias here. So skipping one, this is a different Brodia and then a Brodia down here. Um, and then we have the two Dicolostoma down in the lower corner and up in the upper right corner. And the former Dicolostoma, which is now Dipterostemon, which commonly known as the blue dicks or maybe now blue dips with a P. Uh, and lastly, we have two Mariposa lilies in the genus Calicordis. Uh, the Calicordis are in a different family. They're in the Liliaceae, they're in the lily family. And though these two flowers look pretty different to the, um, you know, at first glance, these are actually the same species. This is Calicordis um, superbus, or I like to call it superba, because that's how it's spelled. Uh, helps me remember. And uh, yeah, these, uh, these geophytes are um, wonderful, kind of like late spring, early summer blooming plants. And on several of them, including the um, Dipterostemon, Dicolostoma, and Brodia, the, the part you really have to pay attention to is are these ex, um, extensions in the center of the flower these are called staminodes they're basically infertile stamens that don't have an anther at the end and the shape of them and how much they're curved and where they're placed in the flower is the number one thing you're going to be looking at when you're trying to identify a brodia and you can see just from this one right here and then going over to the first one on the upper left the staminodes are all the way on the outside of the of the uh, throat here so they're really separated and so uh, just to show you some of the diversity of the geophytes. Okay, now within the grasslands, you're gonna get these specialized habitats, which we all know and love. They're called vernal pools, and they're characterized by these as seasonal wetlands. They basically are depressions with hard pan bottoms. The so winter rains come and fill the, um, the depressions, and then that water can't drain out, and instead it evaporates um, as, the temperature, uh, as the temperature warms up. And so, you get these gradients, these micro gradients of moisture um, on the outside. And so you end up with concentric rings of plants. Like you have the Sedalcia and Plagiobothrus on the outside, but then in the middle you have uh, gold fields and probably some other little herbaceous stuff in the center there. And vernal pools, they have a high degree of endemism, meaning that there are so many plants that are strictly found in vernal pools. And so I, I include them sort of tangent to the grasslands, implying that they're at lower elevation, you can get vernal pools at pretty much any elevation in California. We have montane vernal pools, which are spectacular when you get up in the high elevations. And uh, pretty much you're gonna find these filled with herbs, uh, also grasses, uh, a lot of the um, graminoids, uh, grasses, sedges, and rushes. And you'll find flowers like downingia, you'll find quill warts, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, plagiobothrus, the popcorn flowers, Meadow foams are, are a wonderful um, flower in vernal pools, and then gold fields, which are Lasthenia species. And of course, uh, unfortunately, our vernal pools are under threat. Um, there's less than 10% of the historic vernal pools in California remain, and you know that's due to development. You know, we we put um, shopping malls and, and parking lots and, and tract housing over areas that vernal pools used, used to occupy. Certainly in the Central Valley, agriculture uh, has significantly altered the valley floor um, and with it comes altered hydrology. So the water uh, patterns are very, very different. Whereas the Central Valley used to, you know, flood and used to be a, a, a delta, swampy, marshy kind of habitat. Um, you know, now it's very dry and there's orchards and, and row crops and things like that. So it's very, very different than it was uh, 100, 200 years ago. Uh, and the vernal pools, you know, contain many rare plants and animals because there's like the fairy shrimp and, and I, I think some others, uh, although animals are not my specialty, uh, that rely on these vernal pools. And if we lose the vernal pools, we lose the associated plants and the associated animals. 
Okay, we think of vernal pools as being these splashes of color on the landscape, and often you could even just be driving down the highway and just and see a vernal pool at, at you know 70 miles an hour. Um, but we're going to start with the color green. And so we have two uh, plants which really like to have their feet wet. They typically grow in the pools when they're still standing water. Um, the one on the left, the Eryngium, which is a member of the carrot family, a uh, very spiky plant. And these uh, will start growing when there's water still in the pools and then the water evaporates and then they bloom and then they set seeds. So they actually persist for a very long time. And sometimes they can form these really awesome stands of uh, geometric delight here. And then on the right, we have the flowering quillwort, which is named for its resemblance to isoetes, which are the quillworts, except this is actually a flowering plant and the quillworts are not flowering plants. Um, and though this picture doesn't show it, at the tips of these leaves, you get these really interesting and bizarre flowers. Um, these, these plants are sort of in a league all of their own. They're a member of a family that's just absolutely bizarre and I could probably um, waste a half an hour just talking about them. So I won't bother, we'll keep moving on. Uh, all right, on the opposite end of the showy spectrum right here, we have Downingia on the left. Um, this is Downingia bicornata, the double horn calico flower. This is in the bellflower family, Campanulaceae. Uh, very dainty, very, very tiny plants, and yet they are so unbelievably ornate and beautiful. We have a dozen or so species in California, and the differences between them are very subtle. Uh, to put it the least. They require some serious getting on your belly in a wet habitat kind of study in order to work with them. Uh, again, and on the other side of the spe uh, showing this spectrum, we have Eleocris macrostachia, the pale spike rush. So this is one of the graminoids. Um, I take umbrage with this common name. Uh, specifically, all Eleocris are called spike rushes. However, Eleocris are in the sedge family. They're not rushes, they're not in the same family as rushes. They are close, more closely related to sedges, yet we've given them the common name spike rush for some reason. I mean, I get the spike part, but not so much the rush part. Okay, moving on, we have two very, very interesting plants that look um, awfully similar. And so on the left, we have Isoetes natalii, that's Nuttles quillwort. On the right, we have Pilularia americana. Now, both of these plants, neither of these plants, I should say, are flowering plants. Uh, the one on the right, the Pilularia, is actually a fern. It's a true fern. And you can think of this as, this is the full mature plant right here uh, that looks like a little grass with a little corm below it. Um, basically, how you want to think of this plant is like a fern, like your typical fern with a frond, except it's lost all the leafy parts, and it just has the stipe remaining. And so when you watch these uh, start out for the year and they're unfurling, they're curled like a fiddlehead, and they uncurl just like uh, your, normal, uh, your normal ferns, they just don't have any leaves. And then on the left side, the isoetes, these are what's called a lycopod. And so those are fern allies in the sense that they are sort of like ferns. They're more like ferns than they are like flowering plants, uh, but they're distinct enough that they're in their own class. And so the technical difference between the two is the lycopod, so this isoetes here, has one vein on its leaves, and the pilularia, which is a true fern, has many veins. Uh, and so that's, you know, you basically have to cut a cross section, look at it under a microscope, but uh, you can get a gestalt for them over time if you start uh, poking around in some of these grass-like plants that are in the vernal pools. Um, very, very interesting plants, both reproduce with spores and not with seeds. Okay, the uh, blue oak woodland, we're moving up in elevation now. Uh, this habitat forms a bathtub ring around the Central Valley, um, and you know you get blue oak woodland basically on on all of the hills surrounding that Central Valley from north to south. Um, although this is one of the fastest developing areas of California, so we are losing this habitat at an alarming rate, especially in Placer County, which is the fastest growing uh, county as far as development goes in California right now. Uh, basically. Um, Sacramento is crawling outwards and absorbing Western Placer County. It's pretty unfortunate because the Blue Oak Woodlands are fantastic and the plant life there is amazing. Uh, so you start to see a lot more trees and shrubs. You get the Blue Oak and the Gray Pine, which are the two really uh, characteristic species of this area. And you also get the interior live oak, uh, which I think you guys on the coast get the coast live oak. I don't know if you have interior live oak, uh, but maybe you do. Um, coyote brush, uh, that's one we both share, and redbud as well. 
And then the herbaceous layer are things like the mariposa lilies, the tarweeds, uh, coyote mint, and my one of my favorite violets, the Douglas violet, which has really uh, highly divided cut leaves. You can't you can't mistake it once you learn it. All right, we're going to start with some parasitic plants. Uh, these ones grow. These are endophytic. They live in trees. Um, two kinds of mistletoes, and mistletoes are fascinating plants. Um, the seeds are deposited on a branch and they germinate and they send out these roots, these specialized roots, which are called historia, uh, hostoria, like H-A-U-S-T-O-R-I-A. And those bury into the tissue of the host plant and tap into the vascular system. And because they don't have the roots in the ground, they need to get all of their water. Um, and in the case of the one on the left, uh, Arceuthobium campylopodum, which is a uh, contender for the award of one of the most difficult scientific names to say out loud. Um, it has no chlorophyll. It is not green. It doesn't produce its own food, so therefore it relies on the plants that it grows onto and parasitizes for the sugars as well. In this case, uh, this one grows on conifers. In this area, pretty much gray pine. On the other side, we have Phorodendron leucarpum, the American mistletoe or the oak mistletoe. This one grows in oaks, but also other hardwoods. You can find them in cottonwoods and, and, and similar trees like that. And this one does photosynthesize to some degree, so it does provide some of its own food, but not all of it. Uh, it takes a little bit from the tree. And I should mention, at the risk of ranting, that uh, you know these are native plants. Uh, they co-evolved here. They don't harm the tree on any sort of time scale that's important to us. Um, you know, you're talking decades and decades before they have any noticeable effect. Um, they don't really, they don't spread throughout the tree on their own. Uh, if you have an oak tree and it's loaded with mistletoe, you should be very happy because that just means that birds which spread the seeds really love to land in your tree and they have planted many mistletoe so that they have food in the berries and they have nesting sites because even like in the center picture when the oaks have lost all of their leaves in the winter, the, um, the mistletoe remains leafy and gives that protection to the bird life. They're really fascinating plants. Okay, so here we go. These are two more uh, plants in the Themidaceae, so they're related to the Dicolostoma and the Brodia. Uh, these are the two species of uh, purplish tritalia that we have that can be easily confused for each other. The, uh, what you're going to want to look for is the attachment of the stamens. And so you have the stamens on this Tritalia bridges the eye, and all of the stamens are attached, all six of them are attached at the same level around the floor, floral tube here. And if you look over at the Tritalia laxa, they alternate at different levels. So every, one, every other one is a little lower and then a little higher, a little lower and a little higher. And so that's really the diagnostics that you're looking to tell these two apart. Although there's some other things you can turn to, like the fact that Bridges EI has blue pollen. Um, and also a very light ring around the uh, perianth parts right here. So you can usually tell this one at a distance. And I also want to point out that both of these pictures are pretty diagnostic for the genus Tritalia because the Tritalia have the stamens attached to the anthers in the center of the anther. So it basically makes like a T-shape. Like if you look over here at the Tritalia laxa, you have this little T-shape or like a mushroom shape. And so some of the other genera in this family, the, uh, the anther attaches at the end rather than in the center. Okay, two, um, two members of the Asteraceae where the flowers are kind of, you know, not to judge them, but a little forgettable. You're, you're likely to overlook them, not pay a lot of attention. They're little yellow composites. Uh, but when they are in seed, like these two plants are, they come alive. You really notice them on the landscape. And uh, basically they each have these two, this is the pappus, this is a, in, in these species and, and some others in the sunflower family, it's more um, papery than feathery. And so uh, you can tell these two apart because the blow wives over here, which is a Kirikina mollis, uh, another really hard one to pronounce, uh, has rounded tips to its pappus. And the Europappus lindleyi, the silver puffs, has these very distinct points. Uh, and so even though these seeds don't float on the wind the way, say, like a dandelion seed would. Uh, the pappus, nonetheless, does help disperse their seeds moderately far from the parent plant. And uh, any little bit of distance you can get from the parent is going to benefit the plant. Okay, we have warrior's plume. This is a hemiparasitic plant. And when I say hemiparasitic, that means it is parasitic, kind of. 
Um, it taps into the roots of shrubs uh, around it, usually something like a manzanita or a toyon, um, possibly a cenothus even. Uh, but it does have some green and it does produce some of its own chlorophyll. So it is not truly parasitic. It does not rely on the host entirely. Uh, it just gets an extra little boost from its host. So this is Pedicularis densiflora. And uh, I should be forthright, this is not actually Pedicularis densiflora because they recently changed the name. Uh, this is Pedicularis orantiacus, but I went with the old name because that new name is not in Jepson quite yet. It hasn't quite been recognized by the powers that be, but uh, look for it soon. Uh, Pedicularis densiflora has been split into two species, densiflora and orantiacus, which is shown here. And um, yeah, let's move on to gabbro. So gabbro is a really fascinating habitat type. Shane, it looks like uh, you're frozen. Oh. Yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you, your screen um, stopped. Yeah, I got booted off the internet, so I'm trying to reconnect. Okay, no problem. I apologize about that. Bear with me, folks. You know, since you can hear me, I'll opine a little bit. Um, one of the most wonderful thing uh, about all of us getting on Zoom is that we can attend uh, presentations from all around the state. You know, we can. Wonderful. Um, but it also means that we're beholden to uh, bandwidth limits and Wi-Fi signals and that sort of thing. So, um, it, you know, the good comes with the bad. But I think I'm back. Hopefully. You can see my screen again. Just let me know if you can. We can't. Uh, it's loading right now. Now we are. We're there. We're all right. We're we're back in business. All right. <laughs> Thank you um, for your patience. Uh, hopefully that does not happen again. Um, all right. So now we're on the gabbro habitats. Uh, gabbro is an ultra mafic uh, soil type, by which we mean it is magnesium and iron rich. However, it is low in calcium and other essential nutrients. So you, you have a ba basically a very special plant that can deal with those conditions. And often they're hot and they're dry and they're exposed. And so you get a, um, a lot of rare species and you get a lot of specialized species that grow only where this soil type exists. And so um, for shrubs, you get various uh, manzanita species and ceanothus. They're, they're, um, there's a high diversity of those species and they can handle some of this gabbro. Uh, one of my favorites in the area is the chaparral pea, which uh, is filled with these pink blooms in the spring and uh, just like lights up the, the chaparral there. And some of the herbs, you have bolanders, mule's ears, and the rare chaparral sedge grows in our area, although um, quite abundant in, in our area. Okay, so we're gonna start with a shrub uh, or a small tree. Uh, which is Hesperocyparis mcnabiana, the mcnab cypress. Uh, these are fire adapted plants. And I should mention this gabbro habitat is a fire adapted habitat. Like every plant that grows here wants to burn. It has adaptations to survive burn, burns. Um, the burns are beneficial. And this is a great example because in the center here you have these cones. Well, these cones are basically glued shut. And then when a fire comes through, it melts the resins holding the scales of the cone, and then they open up and it spills the seed. And then the adult tree has been burnt out uh, because it has these highly flammable resinous oils in it, and it leaves a nice open habitat for the next generation. So it's this process of renewal and refreshing. And you can see in this uh, shot on the right, these are the uh, glands, and I just lost connection again. So. Wait. Um, we can see the screen, but we cannot see you. So I think um, you can keep on rolling, but we just won't see your video. Okay. Um, all right. Well, <laughs> well, that's McNabb Cypress, I guess. Um, I just want to check. Did you see the slide change? Or is it frozen? Uh, we're now at McNabb Cypress. 
Okay, so yeah, it is frozen and you did not see the slide change. Oh, now we're at flannel bush. Okay. Again, sorry folks, uh, rural internet. Um, <laughs> so here we have the flannel bush, um, Fremontodendron question mark. Um, and that's because the populations of Fremontodendron that grow in Nevada and also Yuba County are uh, very interesting plants. And in fact, the Redbud chapter in conjunction with the El Dorado chapter are currently funding a study with the labs uh, run by Dr. Doctors Dan Potter and Shannon Still. And there is, to back up a second, there is a note in the Jepson manual that mentions um, that the Fremontodendron in Nevada and Yuba County are genetically and morphologically distinct and they need study. And so I'm proud to say we are doing that study and uh, we're gonna make that note obsolete pretty soon. And the idea is that these plants have the growth form and the substrate uh, preference of the rare Pine Hill flannel bush, which is known from the Pine Hill formation in El Dorado County. However, the flower color uh, and the plant hairs and the leaf shape are more like Californicum, which is a really widespread uh, species throughout California. And you can see here that there's a little bit of a color difference. So like the bases of the petals are kind of that orange color, which is the color of the Pine Hill flannel bush uh, flowers. But also Pine Hill flannel bush has way bigger uh, hairs on the, on the leaves here compared to the ones we have. At the same time, they grow really decumbent, you know, and that's, it's uh, Fremontodendron decumbens is the Pine Hill flannel bush. And yet these plants here are decumbent. They're not very tall. They spread out. They're much wider than they are tall. And so we're going to do some genetic testing and we're going to figure out what we have. And so uh, hopefully at a future presentation, I'll get to talk about whether we have uh, Fremontodendron californicum, Fremontodendron decumbens, uh, a brand new species, which would be entirely like super, super rare and just limited to about um, 25 or 30 uh, populations, or maybe it's a hybrid uh, between decumbens and California. We don't know. We'll find out the answers real soon. Okay, moving on, we have a, a, don a Donostoman uh, Hartwegii, the Hartweg's doll lily, a really fascinating flower because it has these reflexed petals, um, uh, which is pretty unique. And I used to think this was in the, um, in the lily family, but uh, I recently found out actually that this is in a, a family called Picophilaceae, uh, which the difference between that and the liliaceae is that the um, perianth parts, so that's like the petals and the sepals combined, are fused at the base into a tube. And so even though it's reflexed here, these petals are actually fused at the bottom there. And so morphologically, that means that these are closer in appearance to um, plants in agave seed, so like uh, the soap plant or something like that, because they also have fused perianth parts. Um, just a fascinating little plant. It's not restricted to gabbro, but in our area, you're going to find it on gabbro typically. Uh, here is a very cool morning glory. This is Stebbins morning glory, Calisthesia stebinsii. And if you look in the center there, it has these really, really unique hand-shaped uh, like palmate lobed leaves. And even though the flowers are your typical morning glory flower, these leaves are absolutely uh, distinctive and it really likes to grow in open areas that have recently burned in, in the gabbro habitats. Uh, it's only known from Nevada County and from El Dorado County, also at the Pine Hill Formation. And uh, these plants, they basically wait for fire, they grow profusely, they spill out lots of seed into the seed bank, and then they get overtaken by the manzanitas and the other shrubs. And then a fire comes through and clears out the manzanita and other shrubs, and then the cycle renews. So they do really poorly with competition, uh, but once that fire regime comes through, uh, then they blow up, they go crazy. And so our fire suppression activities have really negatively impacted populations of this plant. Okay, so low elevation chaparral, uh, this is sort of similar to the gabbro because, uh, you know, you could call gabbro low elevation chaparral, uh, except it's on a special soil type. And this category is not so um, distinct. It's not so, it doesn't need a specific soil. So these are more generalist plants, uh, more manzanitas, more ceanothus, toyin, coffee berry, and uh, a lot of penstemon and uh, one of our native hypericum or St. John's warts, the gold wire. And uh, all right, so if you are in the low elevations in Nevada or Placer County um, 
And you folks in Sonoma County or elsewhere on the coast are going to be very jealous. You only have two species of manzanita that you have to worry about. We have Arctostaphylus miwaka and Arctostaphylus visita. Um, they both have really similar whitish leaves, but you'll notice Arctostaphylus miwaka has these really long leafy bracts above each uh, peduncle, and visita lacks those leafy bracts. So all you have to do is look quickly at the flowers and you can tell which species you've got. Also, the Miwaka fruits are way bigger and they're kind of chocolatey covered. And uh, Visida has smaller red fruits like these ones in the center photograph. So uh, very easy to tell what manzanita you have in our area. Uh, this is an amazingly beautiful plant. It, uh, the, I wish I had a picture that uh, was decent of the leaves because the margin of the leaves has this silver lining, which you will notice anywhere. It's one of the most beautiful leaves in California uh, plants, uh, but the flowers are not too shabby either. You have these four petaled flowers with little blue speckles, and then this little green dot in the center is the nectary. So that's where um, you know all the nectar is produced and it attracts the pollinators. Um, these are related to the monument plants, which are much larger, and you can get some really awesome uh, stands of it growing kind of in the gaps of the chaparral in our area. Uh, two very smelly plants, the Sonoma sage and the pitcher sage, uh, amazingly smelly plants, I should say. Uh, mint family plants are just fantastic. Uh, between the odors that they produce, um, the foliage is always so beautiful. The flowers are ornate and, and super special. Um, just give it up for Lamiaceae. Love mint, mint family plants. Okay, lower conifer belt. Uh, that's what I've dubbed it. Um, this is basically meets up with the blue oak woodland and the sh the low elevation chaparral kind of intermixes between the two. Uh, you'll find chaparral in openings in the conifer belt um, and also the blue oak woodland. And so here's where you start to get ponderosa pine instead of the gray pine. Here's where the black oak starts showing up instead of the blue oak. Uh, incense cedar makes its appearance. Uh, Madrone starts showing up. Doug firs. Uh, and the understory has uh, a really high level of shrub that can deal with high shade situations like gooseberries and currants, um, our hazelnuts, our native hazelnuts, and of course, mountain misery. All right, here's a selection of the orchids that can be found in the conifer forest. I'm going to start from the right and work my way left. Uh, you have these two Piperia species. Um, the one all the way on the right is Piperia elongata and next to it is Piperia transversa. And the operative point here is this little point coming out of the back of the flower that's called the spur. On transversa, the spur is straight and on elongata, it is curved. Um, that only works to tell these apart in our area where these are the two species that you're going to get. Uh, there are other Piperia that require more careful examination because some of them have also have straight spurs or have curved spurs. But uh, both of those pictures taken in my backyard. Uh, so. I've got orchids in my native orchids in my backyard. I feel pretty blessed about that. Uh, down on the bottom here, I didn't even bother with the flowers because the flowers are not super showy, but these leaves are uh, amazingly showy with uh, the white veins and the marbling. This is Goodyera blongifolia, the rattlesnake orchid. Um, the flowers are really compressed and kind of tiny, and they come out during like the hottest part of the year when I'm usually high up in the mountains and avoiding the heat. So I don't have great photos of them, but um, but the leaves are something else. I uh, wish this could grow in a garden, but alas, orchids are very difficult, uh, if not impossible, to get going in uh, gardens because they are symbiotic with uh, species of fungi. And so if you don't have the fungi in your garden, it's not going to grow there. Um, they basically, they choose their habitat. We can't choose it for them. All right. So above the uh, rattlesnake orchid, we have a Corolla rhiza. This is Corolla rhiza striata, or the striped uh, coral root, and this one is a little late in the season. We had a late rain uh, in about June last year, and it just turned these upper petals translucent, and I thought it made for a really good photo. And moving over to the left, we have the spotted coral root, and the spotted coral root um, obviously has spots on its uh, lower lip right here, as opposed to the stripes of the striped coral root, so those two are pretty easy to tell apart. You have the um, petal ornamentation. And then over finally on the left, you might think that this is a different species of, uh, of orchid. There's another yellow Corolla called Corolla trifida. 
However, this is just a yellow version of the spotted one. And so it lacks the spots, which give it its, give it its name. But what really what you want to look at is this upper petal right here. Actually, I think that's a sepal. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Um, it's one of the two. Uh, but anyway, it has three veins, and Trifida would only have a single vein here. So if you see a yellow orchid in our conifer forest, look at that upper petal and count the veins. Okay, Liliaceae of conifer forest. Um, we'll start from the left this time. We have the rare, although you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who's local who would think that this was rare if you didn't tell them because it's super locally abundant. This is the Humboldt lily. Uh, it's a really tall, really large flowered uh, lily with the flowers pointing down and it grows in dry habitats. And so it's our, I think it's our only, yeah, it's our only orange flowered lily that grows in dry habitats. So really easy to recognize when it's in flower. And next to that, we have the scarlet fritillary, the fritillaria recurva uh, with these checkerboard recurved petals. That's where the recurva part comes from. And this just amazing red coloration, uh, tubular flowers, just stunningly gorgeous. And uh, a little bit of a more acquired taste is the fritillaria micrantha, the brown bells with its greenish brownish speckled flowers, uh, which are much smaller and they're not tubular. Um, they don't have a, you know, they don't have a tube. It's more uh, bell-shaped almost, uh, really common and really variable too. So you'll see these um, in different shades of red and brown and green and yellow, um, but it's probably our most common fertile area in the region. All right, we're back on Calicordis now. Um, on the left, we have Calicordis alba. On the right, we have Calicordis monophylla. And so the Calicordis alba is a white flowered dangling flower. The petals are um, closed in on each other, making giving it its common name, the fairy lanterns. And it's also quite tall. So it's maybe like, um, oh, it can be up to about two feet tall. Meanwhile, monophyllus, the flowers point up, the um, petals are hairy and uh, reflexing, kind of spreading, reflexing. They're, um, it's very short. So you'll find these where the flowers are right along the ground, maybe like two or three inches up, and they maybe get to about six inches tall at the max. And in the center, you have the hybrid between the two, where you get intermediate features. You have flowers that are kind of pointing up. You get petals that are kind of reflexing, kind of, uh, you know, closed in on each other, and about middling in height, about a foot and a half uh, tall. And so you can find the hybrid pretty much anywhere we, where you find the two um, parents. But um, you you don't because it's not super common. It's rare to come across. Okay, our uh, one of our most beautiful plants, the showy milkweed. Everyone loves milkweeds, and this is the showy one. Um, milkweeds are fantastic because of their uh, pollination strategy. In between the the two petals here, there's a little slit, and um, an insect like a bee will come along and you know, mess around in the flower looking for nectar and its leg will fall in that little slit and it'll get trapped. And while it's, you know, uh, trying to shake itself free, uh, the, the milkweed deposits a aggregated sac of pollen called the pollinia and attaches it to the bee. And then eventually the bee frees itself. Although not every time, because sometimes the bee isn't strong enough and you can often find like dead insects with their legs still stuck in the slit on the side of a milkweed flower. And also it's quite dangerous because like here on the right, you'll have predators like this crab spider uh, hang out below the, the milkweeds and wait for the bee to get stuck and then get an easy dinner. Okay, heartwegs wild ginger, uh, Asterum heartwegii. This is um, our, our most common wild ginger in dry-ish areas and you know usually in, in shady, slopey areas. And these flowers right here are petalless. They have no petals. These are just sepals. They're very hairy, as you can see right here, like this shaggy hairy. And I included this picture right here with the leaves that have this really distinct uh, white venation. This picture was actually taken in Shasta County. And um, this white venation is really common from like the Klamath and the North Coast ranges and, and other places that this plant occurs. However, if you look over here, this is one from Nevada and Placer counties, and it has a subtle veining in there, a little bit of a white venation, but certainly not as stark as the other ones. And yet, that the presence of that venation is the split in the key 
for Acerum. So these can be really hard if you're if you have no idea what you're looking at and you're trying to figure out what kind of wild ginger you've got. Uh, you just kind of have to know that elsewhere this species has uh, venation. But you can look at these flowers because there's not too many other plants that have these low growing flowers right along the ground. Um, a typical one does have three, but I found this one that has four, giving it a really symmetrical look, which I thought was kind of cool. Uh, and these plants are pollinated by flies. They don't raise their flowers up on stalks. They keep them near the ground and they attract pollinators with the smell. And in this case, it's basically the smell of like rotting flesh or things that, that flies like. And so the flies will get down in that, that flower, pollinate it, and move on to another plant. Okay, serpentine. Um, serpentine is another ultramafic uh, substrate. It's much like gabbro, except serpentine rock is softer than gabbro rock. There's a bunch of chemistry involved here too. That's above uh, my understanding, so I won't get into it, but know they're similar, but different. And I also want to talk very briefly about the difference between uh, serpentine tolerance versus serpentine endemism. Uh, so there's a bunch of plants which can tolerate serpentine and all of the, all that comes with it, the hot, dry habitats, the lack of nutrients, um, the high levels of heavy metals, but they uh, grow off of serpentine as well. And usually when they grow in serpentine, they're dwarfed or um, somehow uh, held back from reaching their full potential, let's say it that way, um, compared to endemism. And these are plants which only grow on serpentine. And uh, you'll see if you go on cow flora, they, they even have like a little, I think it's a six point scale for how endemic a plant is to serpentine or how, how it works as an indicator of the soils below the plant. Um, so here's a, a really cool plant. I like it a lot. It's Lithospermum californicum. It's in the borage family. It has the scorpioid inflorescence that's typical of the borage family. And think of like a scorpion's tail. That's like a scorpioid flower. Um, there aren't too many yellow flowered borages. Uh, one that comes to mind is a fiddle neck. So I wouldn't fault you if you looked at this plant and thought, whoa, what a weird, um, or fiddlehead rather, uh, what a weird fiddlehead. Okay, so we're gonna talk about Streptanthus polygoloides. This is our serpentine endemic uh, uh, jewel flower. And we don't have a huge amount of diversity in jewel flowers in our area. Uh, and at the in the serpentine sites, you get this purple flowered one. If you go lower down on the gabbro sites, you'll get a yellow flowered one. And currently, these are treated as the same species. They have this compressed flower, and we call them Streptanthus polygoloides. But very, very soon, this flower right here that's pictured, the purple flowered ones on serpentines at higher elevation, will be moved to Streptanthus purpurescens. And the yellow flowered one lower down on gabbro is going to be it's going to remain polygoloides. Uh, and then we have a uh, erythronium multiscopidium with its mottled leaves. Uh, doesn't, doesn't have to grow on, so this is a, an example of a, a serpentine tolerant plant. Doesn't have to grow in serpentine, but it really doesn't mind. Uh, you'll find them in pretty big stands on any ultramafic substrate in the area. And they're uh, really beautiful flowers. So here's the round leaf leather root, uh, very, very cool faboid. So it's in Fabaceae and pea family. Um, I like to say it's got the leaves of a clover and the flower of a lupin, um, but this one grows in riparian areas. Uh, I think it's another tolerant species, but the only population that I know in our area grows on a, on a riparian serpentine uh, rivulet. And so it's got these really thick leathery uh, trifoliate, you know, meaning three leaflets. Uh, trifoliate leaves, and then this uh, this stalk of purple, typical pea family flowers that gives it a very much a lupin look. If I didn't tell you that these are the same species, um, probably wouldn't believe me. Okay, shorthorn steerhead, uh, Dicenter possiflora. This is exceedingly uncommon. Uh, I, you know, I hesitate to say rare because it's not a ranked rare species, but um, you. There's, I think there's only one known location in our area where you can find this plant um, related to the bleeding hearts in the poppy family. And it, it blooms very soon after in the spring, like early spring when the snow has just melted out and shorthorn because these little lateral petals here are only about halfway up the rest of the flower. And steer's head, I think that's a pretty apt name. It does kind of look like a steer's head, like a long, uh, well, a shorthorn steer's head. Longhorn steer's head is a different plant. Um, okay, upper conifer belt. So now all of a sudden, firs start showing up, specifically the white fir. Um, they start 
you'll see them at lower elevations in some of the river canyons where uh, it's a little bit more sheltered, but now in the upper conifer belt, the firs start to become the dominant tree. And this is really like a transition zone. So you'll get uh, lower elevation plants, which kind of sneak up into it, and higher, eleva uh, higher elevation plants, which kind of sneak down into it, um, and a few plants which only occur in this belt. And so uh, you get shrubs like bitter cherry start to show up. The green leaf manzanita starts to take over from any of the white leaf or the Indian manzanita. And uh, one of my favorite roadside plants, the poke knotweed, which is, uh, you know, it used to be in, I think it used to be in po uh, polygonum. And it's like a seven foot tall, enormous um, knotweed. It's just a fantastic looking plant. So in uh, Nevada and Placer counties, we have the bush tan oak, which is a certain variety of the tan oak. So it's Nothalitha carpus densiflorus, variety Echinoides. Um, folks on the coast get the tree form, which is variety Densiflorus, uh, but we get the bush form. Uh, we do have a little disjunct section of the tree form um, nearby in Yuba County and kind of going north, I think, into maybe into Plumas County or maybe up into Shasta even. Uh, but lower than Yuba County, you only get the bush form. And, you know, uh, that's really the only difference between these two varieties. In the key, it says, like, one's a bush and one's a tree. And where does a bush start and a tree end, I think, is relatively subjective. But if you look at this habitat shot on the right, or sorry, on the left, um, and you can see they're all, this doesn't look like the tan oaks that you guys get in, uh, near the coast, does it? Uh, and these gorgeous white flowers over here on the right. Uh, I like them a lot. Um, the smell I've heard referred to as spermatic. So I'll just leave that with you. Uh, okay, here's some, here's two orchids which tend to show up more in the upper conifer belt. Um, the one on the right, Cypripedium fasciculatum, is the clustered lady slippers, exceedingly rare. Um, a, a ranked rare plant. Um, there are maybe one or two occurrences in our area. Uh, you can find it more abundantly elsewhere, but we just get just just a, a couple hanging on there and uh, called lady slippers because of this swollen lower lip right here, which kind of gives the impression of like a shoe or a slipper. And then over here, the wonderfully named phantom orchid or ghost orchid uh, for its pure white uh, appearance. And these, these plants smell amazing. It's like vanilla uh, on, on turn to 11, basically. And this particular picture is one cluster of a population that numbered like 200, 300 plants. It was the most amount of phantom orchids I've ever seen in one place. Absolutely fantastic. Um, again, both these plants reliant on soil fungi in order to germinate their seeds and get their food. And here's another plant that's reliant on the soil fungi. Uh, this one, however, is in the blueberry family. It's an ericaceae. It's uh, part of a clade, maybe clade is not the right word, but uh, certainly a group in the blueberry family uh, called the monotropoids. And they often lack chlorophyll like this one. And so they rely on parasitizing fungi in the soil in order to get all of their food. Uh, this is Pleurocospora fimbriolata. Fim and uh, you can see it in all of its different stages from just emerging to full flower and then producing these plump little fruits. And uh, super uncommon to come across, um, but probably more common than one would think because it tends to like undisturbed uh, forest understory habitats. And, you know, if it's undisturbed and people don't go there. So it, it might exist in places that are hard to get to. Uh, all right. Time to talk about Darlingtonia californica. And uh, this is our native pitcher plant. Nevada County is the southernmost extent for this plant. So we are so lucky. We have one, one population, maybe a few more, one population I know about, put it that way, uh, of the pitcher plant. Uh, on the left side, you have the flower of the pitcher plant. On the right side, you have the leaf of the pitcher plant, which forms this funnel. It has an opening on the underside and insects fly up into that opening. And they, um, been all around. It has these little windows on the top, like clear windows. And if you've ever seen like a fly that gets stuck inside your house and they just incessantly bang against the window, the same tendency is exploited here by the Darlingtonia. And so these flies think that they can fly out, a uh, fly up rather, and they don't realize they have to fly down and around to get out. And so they just bang up against the roof of this plant over and over again and tire themselves out and then fall into the base where there's this like soupy liquid which is filled with microorganisms 
um, and the fly lands, drowns, the microorganisms digest the insect and release the nutrients to the benefit of the uh, pitcher plant, which tends to grow in these sort of um, low nutrient acidic bog habitats with uh, cold running water. Uh, it's really amazing. Carnivorous plants are truly amazing. We're so lucky to have them. Uh, rare plant, by the way. This one uh, is nature's barber pole. Uh, we got the sugar stick, Allotropa vergata. Uh, looks delectable, right? Like you bite into it like a candy cane. Seems like it would be peppermint scented or something. Uh, here's another plant in the blueberry family, another monotropoid. This one has some, uh, this amazing white and red candy striping. It's like something out of a Dr. Seuss book. Um, another one that's reliant on soil fungi. This, this plant specifically parasitizes the mycelium of Matsutake mushroom. So um, ostensibly, if you visited, if you found a patch of allotropa and you went back in the winter, you would find Matsutake growing there, um, assuming that the Matsutake is fruiting. Okay, so here's the, the other dryland lily that we have in our area. It occurs a little higher up than the Humboldt lily. It's also white, uh, Lilium Washingtonianum. Um, so if you basically, if you find a lily growing in a dry area, it's one of the two. It's either Humboldt lily or Washington lily. And when it blooms and you see the flower color, you should be able to tell the difference between the two. All right, river canyons. Um, river canyons are underappreciated as a habitat, in my opinion. Um, you get moisture and elevation gradients on such a small scale, uh, different topographies. You get higher humidity than normal. And you have the influence of aspect. So whether um, a part of the river is facing the north or the south or the east and the west, and you get different plants on each little ridge and, um, and these little alcoves that plants can, can hide out and survive. And they're just, uh, they're fascinating to explore. It's not really difficult to traverse, but I try to get in, in river canyons. If I see a river canyon, I'm going into it. But, so uh, some of the trees, that we have in our area are basically only found in river canyons. Um, the California bay tree, which is really abundant on the coast in like a lots of areas because you guys have more humidity, uh, only really exists in the river canyons for us. So it's kind of associated with the river canyons out here. And same with the mock orange, um, really only find it on these slopey, more humid areas. You won't find it up on the ridges or any of the flatlands. Um, the bush monkey flower, Diplacus grandiflora, and, or I think it's grandifloris, that's a typo there, uh, and silver bush lupin, Lupinus albifrons, the two of them often coincide on the rocky exposed sides of river canyons, and the blue plus the orange, it's just a fantastic color combination, like a Rockwell painting or something. Uh, and then we, we get some cool vines, like Dustin pipe and wild grape. And also our river canyons are some of the best places to see our native succulents. Uh, on either side, we have sedum spathofolium. This is the broadleaf sedum, uh, named so because it's got broad leaves. Pretty self-explanatory there. Uh, and then puts up these yellow spikes of unfurling, kind of curled flowers. Um, they're pretty gorgeous. And then in the center, we have our only native Dudleya, which is Dudleya cymosa. Um, this plant really likes to be on vertical rock walls but I've seen it in some weird places, some pretty dry um, rock faces as well, which makes me think like, what's going on there? Why, how can it deal, how can this succulent deal with um, really wet areas and really dry areas? And yet it's all the same species, but I digress. Um, this is Cantalos lewisia, uh, a rare plant. Um, only a couple populations in our area. It really likes vertical mossy rock faces, like over in the picture on the left, the, um, the leaves are serrated and they get these beautiful, uh, really long flower stalks with these candy striped pink flowers, um, stunning, stunning plant. And unfortunately, uh, an easy target for poachers, even though Lewisia do not survive transplanting the way that like Dudleyas do. So people kind of um, transmute the idea that they can just like they think it's a succulent, they could take it home, pot it up, and it's going to survive, and they poach it, and yet this one will not survive. Um, so I've, uh, was, when I took these, these specific pictures, I found a couple plants dried out on the trail, which was very, very tragic. Someone had picked it, didn't know what it was, and then just left it there. So don't pick the plants. That's, that's the moral of this story. 
Okay, here's a plant that um, you guys might uh, be really familiar with, um, but it is unheard of out here until last year when I found a population of it growing in the Yuba River Canyon. Uh, Sedum radiatum, the Coast Range stone crop. Uh, when I first saw it, it was not flowering, and I thought maybe somebody had just dropped um, a cutting of some kind of horticultural sedum. And I just had it in the back of my mind to go back there and return when it was flowering. And I was able to do that, and it keyed uh, precisely the sedum radiatum. So this is a case of a coastal disjunct. Um, for whatever reason, either it used to occur in a larger area and now just remains in this little island in the river canyon where it was protected, or maybe the habitat used to be contiguous. And then as the Central Valley opened up, it created this chasm with, that it couldn't cross. But in any case, sedum radiatum still persisting in Nevada County. I made a collection of this. It's now in the herbarium. So now we know it's here. Um, so this is our, well, until uh, me and a couple friends got to this plant, this was the only plant that I'm aware of that was entirely endemic to Nevada County. And I think I just got booted off the internet again. Did it freeze? Can you hear me? We, oh, we, shoot, we could hear, we did see it and then now it's gone. Okay. We can hear Sorry you. <laughs> well, while I'm trying to reconnect, I will tell you the story of True's jewel flower. So as I was saying, uh, this plant, which is a subspecies of Streptanthus tortuosus, uh, was thought to be endemic to Nevada County. It only grew in this very small section of the River Canyon, uh, the middle fork of the Yuba River. And um, that was until we went looking to see if we could find it elsewhere. And sure enough, we found it, oh, about a quarter mile away, just across the middle Yuba River in Sierra County. Uh, and made a collection, therefore ending its endemism in Nevada County on sort of a technicality. Um, however, a couple weeks later, I was um, browsing iNaturalist, as I often do, and I came across a observation out there which was listed as unknown species. All right, I think I'm back in. I'm going to share my screen again so you can see this beautiful picture. Let me know when you can see it. <laughs> um, so where was I? Oh yeah, I'm browsing iNaturalist. I come across this picture of a plant which looks really familiar and it's listed as unknown species. And I realize that is Streptanthus tortuosus subspecies truei. However, it's in the South Yuba River Canyon. And uh, I contacted the person who had um, seen this and asked them if the coordinates were correct and they confirmed that it was and we went out and actually did all the measurements and everything that's required and confirmed that yes this was the rare uh jewel flower and it was found about uh, 30 miles or so away uh, on a, a higher elevation section of the south yuba river and so we extended its uh, known range so now it's known from the middle and the south um yuba river and i'm still Sorry uh, for my internet troubles here because I seem to have gotten booted off again. Um, what can you do? Sorry, bear with me for one second here. Um, I wonder if, um, Cody, we have any questions or if people would like to add questions into the chat. Um, that's a great yeah, opportunity yeah. to do that right now. And then maybe we could take a moment for questions. Um, yeah, we'll call this an intermission. <laughs> great opportunity. If it's those things that you've been wondering. Out. Actually, I have a question since I, I get this opportunity. Um, those, the two fern and fern-like species, and I can't remember the names of them, they're real small. Um, yeah, Isoides and Tellularia. 
Yeah. Where are the spores? Are they on that? They're just on that stalk then? Yeah, but in both cases, they're born in um, at the bases of the leaves, believe it or not. They form little capsules. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I've actually never seen the, um, I haven't been there at the right time to ever see them actually forming the, uh, the spores. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's what I read anyway. <laughs> Okay. okay, so Looks I seem like to be back in. I don't know how to traverse because I've called in. I'm not sure how to traverse the audio right now, but I'm just okay. going to share my screen. Oh, I need to be made co-host again. Oh, I can uh -huh. work on that. To find your video. Just a moment. Uh, Shane, there is a question <laughs> asking, are you aware of any other Calicordis hybrids either occurring nearby or anywhere else in the state? Uh, yeah, um, there's actually, there's a really fascinating thread on the CMPS forum right now talking about a uh, Calicordis hybrid. And I'm, I don't know the um, parents of it, uh, it's of two species that I'm not familiar with, but certainly uh, Calicordis are promiscuous. And I, I'm pretty sure you, one could find hybrids of any uh, co-occurring or most co-occurring species of Calicordis. I don't think that's um, out of the range of possibility at all. Okay, do we want to take any more questions or am I back up again? I think I'm back up again. Yes, it looks like it's your screen is loading. Okay. <laughs> there we are. A small one. Okay. Oh, well, we might as well keep going. Um, so an, another plant that I think uh, you folks are very familiar with, um, this is the deer fern, Struthio Struthiopterus vacant. Um, this plant had, this fern had uh, never been seen in Nevada County until I found it at a pretty high elevation river canyon. Um, and interestingly, the ones I've seen on the coast are all sort of erect. Um, and this one was very droopy, so I don't know if there's something happening there. Maybe I haven't seen enough deer fern on the coast, and they are droopy there too. But um, just you know, I tend to note differences where I see them. And the picture in the center is kind of the habitat where I found it. So this was in Cipollo Creek, um, which is up at about oh 4,500 feet or so, and just this like amazing population of deer fern. Um, and so yeah, got to make a record of that also occurring, which I have to say, like it. You'd think that uh, everything's been explored, there's nothing to find, but in just uh, a, a few years of me really going out and looking for plants, um, I have found tons of things in our counties that weren't supposed to be there or nobody knew was there before. Um, so go out and explore, that's my message. Okay, lava caps. Uh, these are misleadingly called lava caps because they're actually formed by volcanic mud flows and not lava. Um, they're usually open, rocky areas, and they're often at ridgetops. Um, in our area, the most famous lava cap is the Hell's Half Acre formation just outside of Grass Valley. Um, really awesome place where you can see plants that you can't find elsewhere in the region. Um, some of the shrubs you'll see here, like manzanitas, very sort of typical rocky soil, chaparral habitats. Uh, you get a, a lot of monkey flowers, um, clarkias, and areogonum, the wild buckwheat. Um, this is a really cool monkey flower that grows at Hell's Half Acre. It's Diplacus angustatus. Um, it is very, very small. It's about an inch tall or so, and it grows in these big stands. Uh, funnily enough, in the footpaths and any roads, it really likes the, the compacted soil. It doesn't, maybe it doesn't do well with competition or, or somehow it, it just prefers to be in the path. Um, and then I also found this really cool white flowered version of it, but gorgeous little Diplacus there. Um, this is Areogonum pratnianum, Pratton's buckwheat, or also known as Nevada City buckwheat, because the type specimen was collected in Nevada City. And when I say type specimen, every species that is uh, described ha is associated with a type specimen. Um, it's a very specific herbarium record. And uh, without getting into the nitty gritty of taxonomy, um, just know that the type specimen for Pratton's buckwheat was collected very nearby to where this picture was taken. Um, and really cool, like poof ball flowers on this shrubby areogonum, um, which you don't see too often. I'm pretty much only on our lava caps. And the lava caps also produce some of the best wildflower displays that we get in the spring. Um, 
though the one in the center is very, very tiny. You might miss it amongst all the other flowers. It's Gethopsis specularioides, specularioides, missed a syllable there. Um, very, very, very tiny, but you will find it growing amongst all of these other like meadow foam and gold fields and lupins and um, really cool flowers. Uh, and here, now we're at a higher elevation lava cap, so there's no real elevation distribution. They can be at a range of elevations. This is a higher elevation lava cap in Placer County, and we get Lewisia cologiae, uh, which is a gorgeous uh, Lewisia. It's almost like Lewisia uh, rediviva or rediviva, however you pronounce that one, except for the leaves are flattened and not rounded like, um, like that species. But the flowers are just enormous and it pops out of these really dry areas, blooms, and then everything dies back below ground and you don't see it for like 90% of the year. Um, and I think this is a particularly interesting population because there are two subspecies of Lewisia cologiae. Both subspecies are rare plants. And when we try to key this out in to figure out which subspecies we had here, uh, there are three characters you're supposed to look at and had two characters of one subspecies and one character of another sub subspecies. And the suspicion is that in Placer County and kind of the middle Sierras, that the two subspecies kind of integrate. And the, it might be that this species is actually like a, a spectrum um, rather than really distinct. And we just have given names to these distinct points on ult what's ultimately a spectrum. Really beautiful plant, really fantastic. Um, okay, riparian aquatic, your ponds, your streams, creeks, your lake edges, and even submerged plants, uh, which I have an affinity for. I really love sticking my hand in really nasty bodies of water and pulling plants out of there. Um, some of the water-associated trees you might find, willows, cottonwoods, alders. Uh, you find things like buttonbush and spicebush. Uh, and of course, a high diversity of rushes, sedges. You get these cool floating leaf plants that grow in the water called um, pondweeds, and those are in the Potomagetan genus and cattails, which some are native, some are not. Uh, here's a cool plant known from uh, river corridors, the uh, Indian rhubarb or the umbrella plant. When it blooms, you can see in the center picture, it has these giant rhizomes that just attach to rocks in ways that I, have, I don't understand how one even gets established and grows into this crazy rhizome. Um, when it drops its seed into a moving body of water, it, anyway, it's mysterious and I love it. But uh, it sends up its flower stalks first, and it produces these really cool pinkish ornate flowers. And then those die back, and you get these giant, giant leaves um, that rise up and uh, basically shade out like the entire riparian corridors. You can find really extensive stands of this plant in um, a lot of the waterways in our area. Um, these are two plants in the Saxifragaceae family that are in the same genus. This is the uh, Pectiantias. Um, we have Breweri on the left and Pentandra on the right. And what you want to look at, we'll start with Pentandra. Uh, these are the anthers. These are the stamens right here, um, this little dot. And these are the petals, the really ornate lacy petals. And with Pentandra, the, um, the stamens and the petals are uh, alternate. So they're, in, they're lined up with each other. Everywhere you get a stamen, you get a petal. And then Breweri, which you can kind of make out in this picture here. Um, sorry, I meant to say these are opposite. I meant to say the opposite of what I said. Uh, and these ones over here and Breweri are the alternate ones where it, you basically have you know, stamen, then petal, then stamen, then petal, and they alternate around the flower. And so you got to look pretty close and check out these beautiful lobe stigmas in the center. Just really gorgeous plants, usually in high elevation. Center pictures, just to give you an idea of the kind of habitat you might find those plants in. Uh, we have a whole suite of orchids, which grow really close to water uh, from left to right. The stream orchid, really common. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the only orchids which doesn't uh, entirely rely on fungi in the soil. So it actually can kind of survive on its own without any sort of fungal partner, which is kind of unique and pretty cool. Uh, the white bog orchid with its white flowers and the sparse flower rain orchid, these two can grow side by side sometimes. and the uh, main difference is the flower color. You get these really cool green flowers. I've got a, a soft spot for green flowers, and I don't really know why. Um, it just seems improbable, and therefore I like it. Uh, next, we got some uh, fantastic water plants. On the left, we have a four-leaf clover, 
but wait, it's not a four-leaf clover. It's the hairy water clover, Marsalia vespita. This is a fern that you're looking at. This is a floating fern with four petals. It looks like a clover, but it doesn't produce seeds, doesn't produce flowers. It produces spores. Um, it is an aquatic fern, believe it or not. Uh, the bog bean, uh, Mayanthes trifoliata, uh, really awesomely uh, ornate flowers here. These, these flower stalks just arise out of bodies of water. Like you'll just be looking at it at a lake and this whole flower will be poking out of the middle of the water. It's really cool. And they call it bog bean because the fruit kind of kind of look like beans and they grow in bogs. It's not that imaginative, but it works. And then Sparganium immersum, which I like a lot. It kind of looks like, um, like a, a uh, like a sedge or something like that, but it's actually in typhacy, so it's related to cattails. Um, and similarly, like cattails also have this sort of separation. These are the female flowers at the bottom with the white uh, stigmas, and these are the male flowers at the top. Uh, and ca uh, cattails have that as well as like the um, the the sedges, excuse me. And just a really cool, they call it immersed because this is another one that just rises right out of the water. Um, cool plant. Okay, granite outcrops. I think they warrant their own uh, own section here. You get some trees that grow in the deeper soils in between them. You get the Sierra juniper and junipers grandis, lodgepole pine. Uh, you get shrubs like the huckleberry oak. That's all huckleberry oak here in this picture. Uh, and pine mat manzanita, which is um, our fourth species of manzanita, it grows really close to the ground in high elevations. And you get cool plants like the pussy paws and the wild buckwheats. Harlequin lupins show up, although harlequin lupins show up pretty much throughout uh, throughout the area. Uh, they tend to really shine, in my opinion, against the backdrop of a granite outcrop and some really cool penstemon, which we'll talk about. Uh, here's a selection of the Palaeas that grow in these granite outcrops, high elevation Palaeas, uh, Palaea bridgesii, brac, brac, well, I can't pronounce that, Bracoptera, I'm going to say it that way, uh, and Brewerai. And uh, all these Palaeas are really cool plants that can survive through these hot, dry, uh, rocky areas. They all have black wiry stems, which is like something you might associate with like maidenhair ferns. It's a whole, it's a thing of the family Pteridaceae, which these belong to, as well as the Adianthum fern. And yeah, they just, they, they like dry habitats. They're sort of this glaucous, meaning like this blue green color to protect them from the sun. And they grow out of like the bottoms of rock crevices and player pretty cool plants. Um, this is probably the most amazing succulent we have in our area, Sedum obtusatum, the Sierra stone crop. Um, somehow this succulent plant grows like at eight or 9,000 feet in rock crevices. It lays buried under snow for six, seven, eight months of the year. And then the snow melts and it has to deal with like burning hot direct sun um, with, with rocks all around it. It's I don't understand how it manages to survive. And also it comes in a shade of colors, like purple and red and green, yellowish colors. So all the same species though. Uh, this is the longhorn steer's head. So uh, we talked about the shorthorn steer's head. Here's the longhorn steer's head. Uh, longhorn steer's head uh, tends to grow in granite. Uh, longhorn because these lateral petals are uh, extend beyond the reach of the, the main part of the flower. And this plant shows up uh, right after snow melt uh, and disappears super fast. So you have to basically get up high in elevation at just the right time in order to get a picture to, to visit with it. They're also very small, uh, very, very cool plant. That, that flower shape where it looks like a, uh, like a cow's head is just fascinating. Um, here are two plants in the blueberry family, Ericaceae, that grow at high elevations, usually around the margins of lakes that form in the basins of the granite outcrops. Uh, Cassiope mertensiana and Phyllodoche um, breweri. Uh, the Cassiope is called the Western Moss Heather. It makes these little bell flowers. It, it's almost unreal. Uh, and these really uh, exerted long stamened purple flowers of the Phyllodoche are just fantastic. They're, um, they really like the pine needle littered acidic areas uh, in the gaps between the granite outcrops. Okay, on either side, we have two really distinct penstemon. We have the only penstemon of this particular pinkish coloration. We have penstemon newberii. 
Um, really cool shrub, often grows in rocky areas, especially in the granite outcrop. A uh, couple subspecies of that, they're hard to tell apart. Uh, and then on the right, we have the Penstem inducus, uh, also a couple subspecies and also hard to tell apart. You're going to be measuring parts. Um, but it's our only white-flowered penstemon, so you get the pink-flowered and the white-flowered one. You can at least get it to species, even if you can't tell the, the subspecies right away. Uh, and then in the middle, uh, from a totally different family, we have Micranthes bryophora, the bud saxifrage, which has just like a bizarre alien-looking flower. Um, I don't even know what kind of symmetry, what kind of flower symmetry this would be, um, asymmetry maybe. Uh, but it's called bud saxifrage uh, because it produces little tiny bulblets in the leaf axles which drop and propagate the plant asexually so it produces from seed and then also asexually as well uh, now we're up in the real fir forest and by real fir i mean red fir uh, which is abies magnifica it's the, absolutely the dominant tree up here you do get some uh, maybe like mountain hemlock mixed in some other uh, like lodgepole pines as well but really you get these dense stands of giant red firs um, and you get this cool yellow wolf lichen which grows on the trunk and eventually, as you go down the trunk, just stop. And that's said to indicate where the snow level was because the lichen can't grow underneath the snow. So um, sometimes you're standing and looking up 15 feet, 20 feet, and see the ring of a lichen indicating where the snow was and just uh, mind-blowing to think that you're standing what was 20 feet under snow before. Uh, very little in the understory, but occasionally you do get shrubs like uh, white thorn cenothus, the snow brush, uh, green leaf manzanitas. You might get like round leaf um, snowberry and things like that. And herbs, uh, scarlet gilio show up in the openings, brewers angelica, and a pretty good suite of arnica species. Uh, this here is the double honeysuckle, it's Linicera conjugialis. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, it's got two purple flowers right here, but it's got a fused ovary, so it produces these little berries where you can see that's where um, the flowers were attached at one point. It's actually two fused um, ovaries, um, but I don't really like the name double honeysuckle because to me that also brings to mind Linicera involucrata, which has two little berries inside, um, you know, an involucre. Um, so I want to propose an alternate common name based here on the immature fruits, and I think we should call this plant Shrekberry. So who's with me? All right, so now we have a high elevation lilium. This is Lilium parvum. Uh, it's our only Sierran lily where the flowers face up. So really easy to identify, likes wet areas. All, all the lilies are gorgeous, so I can't, can't, high, uh, can't praise them enough. And over here is the woodland pine drops, Terraspora andromeda, uh, andromedia. Um, this is another blueberry family. It's, it's got those like um, blueberry flowers, the manzanita looking flowers, very sticky plant, can grow like really tall, like four or five feet I've seen them. Um, doesn't need to reach the sun, so it's right at home in the forest understory. And uh, these are the little fruits that it, predicts, that it makes, little, little pumpkins basically. Um, this is another fern, uh, Cypridium multifidum. This one's really cool because it's a mycorrhizal fern. So it lives like underground, I think for like two, three, four years. Uh, it's alive, it's, you don't see it. It's just totally below ground and it's getting all of its nutrition from soil fungi. And it's a fern that does that. So I find that fascinating. Uh, but then when it does leaf out, it has these really cool, almost like carrot leaf looking uh, fronds. And these are the infertile fronds. And then it sticks up this fertile frond right here, which has all of these little balls all over it. Um, where the name grape fern comes from. So this is a close up on the right side of the fertile fern. Okay, uh, meadows. This is, uh, I, I love Monte Meadows. What's, I can't say a bad word about them. They're, they're fantastic. You get um, all of your grasses, rushes, and sedge diversity happening there. But of course, the meadow wildflowers, that's what we all came for, right? Uh, and also sometimes you get some stands of corn lily, which are just fascinating. Uh, beautiful whether they're vegetative or in flower and just a uh, so emblematic of the sierras uh, but we got the kamas lily right here this is kamasia comash subspecies breva flora um, this is our more small flowered uh, kamasia it's also the one i come across most often there's another species like lineae um, which i almost never see it's almost always this small flowered one and uh, occasionally a couple of the plants pop up in this white coloration so there's a white color morph um, another animal head, uh, another plant with a name for an animal head. This is the elephant's head, Pedicularis 
Grolandica, just like the warrior's plume, it's also a hemiparasite, this time in the meadows, so it's probably like tapping into some of the grasses maybe, I'm not even really sure, but what a fitting name. Look at this flower right here. You got the uh, ears, you got the trunk. I mean, it's some, it looks just like an elephant's head. It's the perfect name, no complaints there. And uh, next we have the little elephant's head, uh, also a particularis, a tolens, a little less common, um, smaller flowers, but still has that elephant shape to it. Um, and then this picture on the left here is what they look like in fruit. So this, this field was filled with this flower on the right here, but now, um, I mean, I, th I think it still looks pretty cool even when it's in fruit. Uh, this is Portarella carnosula. Uh, it kind of looks like the down India that we talked about in the Verna pools, and this kind of grows in a similar habitat, but Portarella really only grows at higher elevations. And the main difference between down India and Portarella is that uh, on, with down India, when they're in fruit, the fruits open on the side and Portarella, the fruits open at the top. And so you might ask like Shane, how do you know that this is Portarella when there are no fruits? And it's because I guessed. Um, Subalpine here is, we're gonna talk about just below the, the highest points now. Um, got the Western white pine and mountain hemlock show up uh, much more abundantly. You get the sage brushes start to show up. Uh, Astragalus and Castilea are exceedingly abundant. And so we have Eriogonum lobii here, very cool wild buckwheat because the flowers all kind of flop over and just spread out and they have these really spatulate like spoon shaped leaves that are hairy. It's uh, might just be my favorite buckwheat. Uh, and some high elevation monkey flowers. Uh, we have Tillings monkey flowers, kind of looks like the common seat monkey flower and Erythranthi guttata. Uh, but this one makes these massive stands uh, and grows rhizomatously between the rocks and any sort of seepy area at high elevation. Um, re really gorgeous. And over here is Erythranthi iridescence, which used to be called Erythranthi lewisii until uh, Naomi Fraga split up all the mimulus and all of that that moving and shaking that happened in Frymacy. Um, but now Lewisii is uh, reserved for the plants with the darker colored flowers and iridescence has more of like a pink uh, colored flower, but occasionally they can be white like this one up here in the corner. Uh, this is Gentiana calicosa, the mountain bog gentian, um, a stunningly beautiful plant at all times. The foliage is amazing. The buds are like jet black before they bloom, which you can kind of make out in this picture down here on the right. And then you get these fabulously ornate and kind of tubular flowers that are speckled on the inside, speckled on the um, corolla lobes, and they have these appendages in the sinuses between the corolla lobes too. Um, so we have Castilea pruinosa, which kind of looks in this uh, from this angle like a sea anemone or something like this. Um, uh, just it's also one of those three pouched uh, Castileas, uh, so bees. Uh, we'll visit this one, but I've seen some moths on it too, so I don't know how strict that is really. Uh, and moving over to the Orthocarpus cuspidatus in the center uh, with these really um, these stacked bracts that are just absolutely fantastic and this green and purple coloration. These are the little white flowers in here, so these are all, all this other coloration is, uh, is bracts, and then the flowers are these little tiny dots in the center. Uh, and then a high elevation epilobium with really wide petals. I like to say this epilobium is doing its best Clarkia impersonation with these you know, wide petals and that exerted uh, um, style and the four-parted stigma. Uh, it kind of looks like a Clarkia, right? Uh, but it's an epilobium. Uh, epilobium of Cordatum really likes high elevation areas uh, and they're in the same family. So it's an easy mistake to make. Okay, Alpine. Uh, we're getting close to the end here because we have Alpine. Uh, highest elevations in our area, there's very little vegetation. Um, what, what does exist is dwarfed due to the, to the environment um, due to the crushing snow that covers it for a huge amount of the year, a uh, huge portion of the year. And the herbs here, you basically, um, I'll cut to the chase, you get a lot of uh, plants with alpine in its common name when you're in an alpine area, so go figure. Um, Ballhead ipomopsis. This is um, in the, uh, this is like related to gilias and things like that. There's the um, really common scarlet gilia, which has like tubular flowers. And these also have tubular flowers, but they're much smaller. They're held in these clusters, which is where the ball head name comes from. But I'm more into these leaves, these little rosetted leaves. I think they're fantastic. And they kind of make these mounds and like the scree and the rubble at the top of the ridges. Really fantastic plant. Uh, more parasites, 
uh, because I love parasite, parasitic plants. I think they're fascinating. These are two aphylon species. Uh, on the left, we have aphylon fasciculatum. Um, I was told when I posted this in iNaturalist that this is a really uh, unique look for this species. And um, then I was informed that likely all of the aphylon fasciculatum will be split up into different species based on like host preferences and some other morphological information. And uh, someone from the Midwest who is studying this group really wanted to know where this plant was specifically because they'd never seen anything like it. Uh, I think it was on Artemisia. And then over here, the aphylum corbosum with its uh, reddish flowers, uh, flat top room rate because it's got a, a flat top. It's not like the single flowers where the flowers rise up of the leaves. Uh, the leaves are pretty much, well, if you call these leaves, I think they're, they might be bracts. Um, but in any case, no chlorophyll, parasitic on other plants. Okay, this is my favorite willow. Uh, this is the Arctic willow, uh, Salix petrophylla. Uh, these two pictures in the center are to show you the full grown size of this willow. It gets about three inches tall. Um, that's, that's it. And this is a dioecious plant, so they're separate male and female plants. Uh, you have the male on the left here, you have the female on the right. Um, I just can't believe that there's a willow that grows like at nine to 10,000 feet and gets like a couple inches tall. That's fantastic. Uh, here is Sierra Primrose Primula suffrutescens. Um, depending on your outlook, you might say this is the only Primula in California. Um, shout out to people who don't accept Dodecathion, or sorry, who who do accept Dodecathion, because uh, those got moved in the Primula, but this is obviously not like a shooting star at all. Um, I mean, I say, I say that, but it is at least somewhat like a shooting star, so I shouldn't, <laughs> I shouldn't be so severe. Anyway, this is a, a high elevation wildflower, uh, just absolutely glorious. This, the stands of it sometimes are absolutely fantastic. Um, and it's got a really cool flower morphology called pin and thrum. And basically you have in the, in the species, you have some plants with a pin flower and some plants with a thrum flower. And the difference being the levels at which the, um, the style and the stamens are at in the flower. And only Pin flowers can only pollinate thrum flowers and vice versa, but a pin flower can't pollinate another pin flower. And uh, several other plants also have that kind of morphology and it's super bizarre and weird and you can read more about it. Um, okay, mountain chaparral, uh, different communities than low elevation chaparral, but it's still chaparral. It's shrub dominated. Um, you get a lot of ribes species. We have a really cool suite of ribes at high elevations. Um, you get green leaf manzanita showing up, uh, peonies, wild peonies growing in below them, and like woodland stars, and uh, a lot of cool plants. Uh, sometimes you get huge stands of this one, Wyethia mollis, the woolly mule's ears. Uh, very, I feel like this is the um, this is the official plant of like Truckee or something because you just see this this plant growing in huge fields where it's just purely Wyethia mollis, or at least it seems so. Um, and I even found this cool variegated one. That's over here on the right. Uh, really common plant, but no less cool. Uh, this is Hydrophyllum alpestre, uh, one of our two Hydrophyllum species in the county. This one's a higher elevation compared to um, the other species. And the other species has its flowers up on a stalk above the leaves. This one has its flowers down on the ground. Um, really cool plant in the borage family, at least for the remainder of the year before the borage family gets split up again. Um, all right, Lecklin's Mariposa lily. Uh, one of our more, le uh, it's probably the least showy mariposa lily that in the state, uh, super common, um, but you can see there's some variation, you know, the little uh, marks on them are, are in different places or at different intensities. They do have this really nice hairy nectary down here. I'm not hating, uh, especially when you come across something like this, um, which is a purple color morph. Um, I sent this out to some Calicordis expert. Nobody had any had ever seen anything like it. Uh, just kind of stumbled upon it. I thought it was a different species at first because I was not expecting to see a purple colored like lineae at all. And uh, I've got a date on my calendar for this year because we're going to go back and try to relocate it and figure out what's going on. Why is it purple? Um, are there more of them? Does the color persist? Uh, finds like this raise a lot of questions. Uh, and finally, we have the east side scrublands, um, much more arid. Uh, you get desert plants coming up. It's so cool to go out in these areas and see plants that uh, are in common between Nevada County or Placer County and also the, the Great Basin or also the Southern California desert. Um, and it's just a mere 
hours drive away from like the center of population um, in the two counties. Uh, very shrub dominated, a lot of herbs too. So you get Artemisia species, Persiana, uh, Persiana tridentata, the bitter brush and the rose family, and uh, a lot of stragglers, a lot of castellate, just like at the alpine areas. Uh, here's Connectus douglasii. It is a discoid aster, meaning it's made of only the disc flowers. It has no ray flowers, but they are really, really showy discoid plants. And I just love how they move from like a yellow coloration and then they grow a little bit more and they get pink. And then finally they end up pure white. Um, fantastic, like so many colors and just a single plant right there. And these really kind of scurfy filaries right here, which I think are awesome. Um, one of my favorite thistles, the elk thistle, the thistle that decided I don't need a stem. Um, it just grows its flower right in the middle of the basal rosette of leaves. And uh, this is also in the aster family. And you can tell because all, each one of these little things down here is a little five-lobed um, discoid flower. Um, but the lobes are really long on thistles. They have really long lobes. And this picture on the left is actually more interesting than the picture on the right because um, the amount of times I uh, come across this plant, it's much more likely that you're going to be seeing insects going nuts in these flowers than you are to see one without any insects on there. So uh, insects love them, so do I. Uh, and this is, okay, it's hard to choose a favorite thistle, but this is an obvious contender right here. The snowy thistle, Circium occidentale variety candidissimum, um, starkly pure white in color. And you lost me again right at the end, how unfortunate. Um, but I'm gonna keep talking. Uh, uh, just a ghostly white coloration, so tome and toast, so covered in hairs. And the reason the plant like this might be so hairy is because these hairs actually act as a form of like sunscreen for the plant. So it can grow in areas where, um, where the sun, you know, these really arid, dry desert habitats and, uh, be just fine. It doesn't, uh, it's not affected by the UV rays at all, or like very, very little anyway. And of course, um, I have to wait to show the next slide and it's uh, until I'm reconnected. So maybe, should we take another question? Another round of questions? <laughs> hey, yeah, Shane, I'm not sure if we have any more questions at this point, but um, we usually wrap our meetings up around nine. Um, okay, this is actually, this is why it's super unfortunate. Oh, I'm back on because this is my last room. <laughs> All right, can, let me know and it should say loading for you now, but let me know when you can see my screen and I will finish up. We can see your screen. Okay, great. Um, so our last three plants of the evening, um, on the left we have the clustered lupin, um, silvery uh, leaves that like basil leaves and then these uh, typical lupin flowers come up but they're clustered so they're really there's a lot of whorls they're held really closely together and they have these persistent bracts that stick out making this uh, really beautiful lupin um, even when it's in bud. Uh, in the center here we have area dictyon lobii which has the um, uh, the common name of woolly nama because it used to be in the genus nama and I'm proud to tell you that it will soon be back in the genus Nama again, so then that common name will make more sense. And then on the right side, we have uh, uh, Circocarpus, Letifolius, this is the curly uh, mountain mahogany, uh, really common in more arid areas and doesn't make it over the crest of the Sierras. Uh, gorgeous plant, nitrogen fixing plant in the rose family. I just love these desert areas and it produces these plumose, meaning like feathery achenes. Um, which are the seeds. It's a certain kind of seed. Uh, and the whole plant gets covered with them. And when you get to view a sunset or a sunrise from the opposite side of one of these plants, it's one of the most gorgeous sights that you'll ever see. Okay. And so um, the overwhelming message that I want to leave you with is we have so much more to learn about what grows here. Um, get out and explore. Um, you know, I and self-taught using only the public, publicly accessible resources that, that you all have access to, you know, uh, Calflora, the, the eGepson, um, we have so much information available to us right at our fingertips. And we, there are so many more questions 
to answer about the plants that grow in Nevada and Placer counties and anywhere in California. So uh, uh, please go out and botanize and share your plants with all of us. And with that, I wanna thank you all and especially for putting up with my internet problems. I'm so sorry about that, but I do wanna invite you to contact me. That's my email there. And a very thank you, a very special thank you to Hannah Kang for providing some of the Vernal Pool photos that I showed earlier. And I'll happily take any questions. Shane, I, we just have some comments in the chat. Um, just really appreciate uh, your presentation and all the plants that you've brought to life through your slides. Just really wonderful. Um, I'm so impressed by all the diversity and species that in the, the different elevations that you went through. Um, very much thank you. And uh, uh, Cody, do you have any follow up questions? I had one. Well, I see an invitation to come visit uh, Sonoma County. I'm, I'm going to take you up on that, Wendy. All right. I do get out every once in a while, but it's a bit of a trek. <laughs> That'd be great. We'd love to have you. And I wondered if maybe you could comment a little bit on um, on on the collections that you do and and how it is that you you make you you are able to do collections and um, whether other people should be doing doing collections. Sure. Um, yeah, I I abide by um, a certain uh, a certain list of ethics. Uh, when I do my collections. Um, number one, I do not collect nor pick uh, rare plants. Um, there's no need to. Most of them are known about. I can report any occurrences. I can take pictures, uh, get it in the hands of the right people. Um, more common plants, um, I think that they should be collected only in a couple situations. And uh, one of them would be a county record. So like the deer fern I showed or the, the sedum that I showed, um, someone needs to put that in an herbarium so we have a record of the plants that are there. There's a, there's a um, saying that's like a plant without a voucher is just a rumor. And my goal is to turn these rumors into science, basically, uh, to, to show that these plants occur here. And certainly uh, you don't want to take, if you find one plant, you don't want to take that one plant. You want to make sure you have a healthy population if you're going to collect. Um, and it really does help also to know ahead of time what you're collecting so that you don't accidentally just take a rare plant um, trying to figure out what it is. Oh, and the only other category I collect is range extension. So if something um, is outside of the known range, so if I find a plant that's known from the high elevations, but, it's, but I find it at a low elevation, um, I collect from that as well. And uh, yeah, just, if you're putting it in an herbarium, I mean, that's how we learn about the plants in California. Um, and I would say I'm also, I'm working on, on like a checklist for uh, Placer in Nevada County. And I say checklist because um, the other option is a flora. And the difference between a checklist and a flora is a flora has a uh, herbarium specimen collected for every single plant that's included in the flora. And in my mind, with, uh, with the ability to take photographs in my pocket at all times and to be able to share these images out, there's no need to do uh, a voucher of every single plant that you come across. Uh, you can just put every single plant that you come across on iNaturalist and just collect only the ones which are going to help further our understanding. Um, and also there's other um, distinctions like uh, I only collect off of um, places where I have permission to collect as well. And uh, that is a lot harder for folks in your area where there's not as much uh, open wild space. And I do have like some uh, relationships with land trusts who will give me permission to collect on their properties, uh, which is really cool because oftentimes they are uh, protecting plots of lands and they have some of the like only virgin habitats in areas that have otherwise been denuded. And um, yeah, I recommend if anyone's interested in collecting, uh, definitely check out the CMPS collection ethics first and foremost and take those to heart. Um, start there and maybe ask to tag along with somebody who uh, is a prolific collector. 
Great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I know that was a bit of a rambling answer, but I hope it did answer it. <laughs> Definitely. That was that was great. All right. Well, Shane, we're going to wrap this up. Um, thank you so much for everything that you've shared with us, all the slides and um, uh, two hours. And I, I appreciate you sticking with us through all the technology problems that you the internet gave you. So um, uh, we look forward to um, maybe ha hosting you here sometime in Sonoma County. Uh, it'd be great to have you. And thanks again. And thanks everybody for joining us. I hope you have a good rest of your evening. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Really enjoyed it. All right. Bye, everybody.